Chamber of Commerce. I would like to welcome our honorable speakers, Dr. Ilan Govan, Dr. Yoshi Kawakami, and uh, our chairman, Dr. Krishna Nirmalo Sen, Director General of ICC, Dr. Rajiv Singh, for the inaugural uh, session. Um, I would uh, request uh, Dr. Sen to please uh, commence the session with uh, his welcome address. Thank you, so much, Madam. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, very good morning, and today is very because of the beginning of Navaratri, and of course, Kal uh, Kolkata being uh, you know a, a place of Durga Puja. So, uh, greetings on this Durga Puja as well as Navaratri. Uh, today, <clears throat> we are having our second uh, uh, national conference, e-conference. Because of COVID, uh, we are not able to physically meet, but uh, the warmth of uh, meeting all the uh, uh, speakers and uh, the participant and the uh, people who uh, took part in the uh, competition of this uh, awards, uh, a very hearty welcome and greetings to them. Uh, actually, in a a uh, little bit of Indian Chamber of Commerce, which is about to complete his uh, 100 years uh, uh, in the next five years' time. Uh, I had the privilege of listening to our Prime Minister uh, uh, a few uh, months back when he came and addressed the AGM. Uh, came means, of course, electronically connected, and that was a great uh, you know, uh, event uh, uh, to, uh, in the journey of in the Chamber of Commerce, uh, maybe Dr. Singh uh, may mention a few more uh, things uh, about uh, uh, about the Chamber. Uh, coming to our Occupational Health and Safety Expert Panel, uh, I think we are about to be two years uh, in a few uh, days' time. <clears throat> in 2018, it was established, and then we had last year our first uh, 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 event, and then uh, we are trying to more and more industry institution uh, and government collaborations. Uh, so some of our respected members are from universities uh, and uh, of course industries. So uh, the learning research and uh, the transfer of the knowledge uh, to the industry and vice versa is very, very important to take uh, our country forward. I'm very glad also to introduce uh, Dr. R.K. Langhavan, who has been a, a mentor and sort of guide to us, um, who has kindly accepted our invitation to be uh, uh, present in this uh, meeting and speak. I'll take this opportunity while welcoming uh, all everybody also to introduce him uh, in this occasion because he will be immediately after me speaking. Uh, he, ha he has uh, uh, the uh, uh, unique mix of uh, industry. Uh, government uh, in implementation as well as adv advisory position after his uh, graduation from a very premier engineering college uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu. Again, the engineering college, he has done his master's from IIT and also he did his uh, PhD uh, in uh, industrial safety. So, and he's very uniquely equipped with uh, a sort of uh, overall responsibility, and we're very glad that he has. Uh, is the director general of DG Fastly has been a continuous inspiration and support to many of the safety professionals in the country and also the professional organizations like uh, ASSP, India Chapter, as well as many other organizations. So I welcome you, sir, for this uh, uh, conference and also, uh, you know, express our gratitude uh, for uh, this, uh, for accepting this invitation. So I will not take much time. Uh, in between, so I wish all of all of you uh, a very uh, good learning uh, experience, and also uh, request you to participate in more and more professional activities, so that you know we uh, are able to improve the uh, health and safety uh, standards in the country. One uh, uh, important thing to also say that uh, the legislation which has come in, uh, uh, Dr. Ilangawan has been a key contributor to this. I am sure he will be addressing and telling us about the uh, new legislation on occupational safety and health. And now we look forward to hear from him. So with this, I hand over the uh, session to 
uh, very, very respected uh, Dr. Langawan, uh, and I request him to take this session forward. Thank you, Anushka. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. K. M. Sen, Dr. Yoshi Kawakami, Senior Specialist, Occupational Safety and Health, ILO, and Director General ICC, Dr. Rajiv Singh, and uh, delegates of this uh, National League Conference on Occupational Health and Safety, organized by Indian Chamber of Commerce. First of all, I wish you all a very good morning and. Uh, uh, very happy Navratri celebrations and it's really a good coincidence that we are holding this uh, conference on the starting of uh, this Navratri celebration. And it's to remind that, you know, safety reminds uh, our day-to-day -day business and it is part of our life and part of our existence. That's the importance each one of us are uh, imparting, are giving to occupation safety and health. First of all, you know, working with Mr. Sen, uh, you know, it's a long experience. We work together on various occasions. And uh, I'm glad that, you know, in fact, I've been part of, as he has uh, rightly introduced, uh, a lot of other activities which involve Dr. N. K. N. Sen, uh, purely a, a professional in its core. Coming to the, you know, conference, you know, it's... Uh, Basically, I will start with the point which uh, Dr. K. N. Sen has said, you know, we are, the occupational safety and health in the country is in the transformation stage. We all know that uh, the government of India, the respected honorable parliament has passed uh, the occupational safety and health working conditions code 2020, and which has been also published in the Gazette. And now, uh, this is going to be the law of the country after uh, all the procedures are adopted. This particular code, if you look, it's almost uh, subsumes uh, 13 legislation, uh, primarily five legislation. That's very important, particularly the Factories Act, the Mines Act 1952, uh, Building and Other Construction Workers Act 1996, Dog Workers Act 1986, as well as Plantation Labor Act. Of course, these are the five legislations which have original jurisdiction on occupation safety. That means the premises is from a fix wherein the law is made applicable. Of course, the court talks about other requirements like motor transport workers, contract labor, interstate migrant worker, and uh, Sini workers, journalists, working journalists, and so on. Look at the, you know, occupational safety and health in our country. We go by the constitutional principles. We know that is the guiding principle of our, our system. The principle the basis are the directive principles of the constitution is that safety and health should be secured for each and every citizen, both men and women. And we should not abuse children of their tender age. No one should be forced by the economic necessity to work in any avocation unsuited to his age or strength. We need to keep just and humane conditions at workplaces and ensuring employee participation so that, you know, safety participation, your safety committee, uh, we need to have the employee participation in safety management. So this is the uh, constitution provision based on which the whole country moves on as far as the occupation safety and is concerned. And when it comes to constitutional directive principles, it doesn't, you know, differentiate between an organized or unorganized place. It talks about all economic activities. Nowadays, organized, formal, informal, everywhere. And based on this policy, in the year 2009, government of India declared a, uh, this uh, based on the constitution principle, national policy on safety, health, and environment at workplace. This policy gives the broader framework, keeping the preamble 
as the directive principles of our constitution and sets the st stage for occupational safety and health movement in the country. Again, this policy is something where we talked about uh, uh, totally all economic activity, both are uh, organized and unorganized sectors. And policy, one of the important things which I would like to highlight, uh, it will be very ideal to speak in this inaugural function. The ensuring occupation, safety, and health is a fundamental human right of human beings. This one point all of us should keep in mind. It is not only a legal obligation, this is not only a statutory compliance, it is also a human right compliance when it comes to the employer. Otherwise, every employee in a workplace has a right to claim safety and health as a human right. And again, to look at other concepts, I'll highlight one or two, probably that will be more ideal for you to start the conference. We need to look the safety and health as an integral component of all our workplaces. That's the basic strategy. So we need to devise systems, programs, procedures and protocols such that safety and health is the integral component of the operation, maintenance and other activities in the workplace that can never be diluted nor be you know, kept away. It is part and parcel of our existence in our workplaces as well as in our common life. So taking this into consideration, we need to look in terms of uh, you know, proactive, we call it as preventative safety culture. This is what the policy talks about. We need to develop preventative safety culture in our workplaces and there should be continual improvement. Like we talk in standards, the improvement should be continual and there should not be any dilution. The responsibility should be shared by everybody. And there should be a, a, a kind of a system in place, occupational health and safety management system, which takes care of the safety of the workplaces on its own and which can give you a clear cut uh, procedures and protocols for you to manage the organization. The fundamental principle in any organization is involving each and every person in the organization. Down the line, entire cross section of the industry, we have to consider each and every one, and we have to have inclusive occupation safety and management system, a comprehensive, total inclusive safety and health management system. That's the uh, dream of probably every organization is moving forward. Coming to the, you know, code and coming to the legislative framework, one of the, uh, some uh, very important feature of this code is that the code provides for the national board, national occupational safety and health advisory board. It's available in public domain. I request you all of you to go through it and understand the, uh, the, the ideology or the concept behind the complete framework. He talks about uh, the National Occupational Safety Net Advisory Board. The board will be functioning to set standards, set rules and regulations, put guidelines, everything as per the instructions of the government. So it is a technical body, it is a tripartite body, as what we do in all labor law related issues. It's a tripartite body having government, employer, employee, and state government representatives and technical experts. And this board will be setting the standards on occupation safety. Then again, the code uh, provides for a third party auditing, you know, auditing for the under the code, third party auditing so that. Expertise brought in. All of you agree with me if I say the first third party in the legislative framework was the competent person to take uh, Dark Workers Act or Mindset or Factors Act or Bevo's the way. The first technical person come to come inside between uh, the legislative framework to function between the management and inspector. That particular role is the competent person, the person having uh, required knowledge required qualification, required experience, wherein he can deliver the task as required by the law. So then the competent person 
next framework is the third party auditor and this auditor will be looking for all the compliant rules or the requirements meeting the requirements as framed under the code third important point apart from the the code retains uh, the first schedule the list of industries involved in hazardous process it also retains a list of notified notified diseases and uh, the permissible exposure limits at workplaces that's also still a part of the code third important point uh, when you talk about the code it uh, the applicability because uh, has been enhanced when it comes to factory 20 workers are more with power 40 workers are more without power as you know many state governments have brought uh, state amendments so the factory definition has been modified at the same time the the court provides for uh, third party auditing the compounding of offenses this is another important issue the penalties have been increased compliances are very essential so strict compliance to the standards and then there has to be the penalty uh, should be has been increased so that it acts as a deterrence when it comes to occupation safety and health. You look the whole concept, you know, when we talk about the code, unified uh, registration, single registration, unified license. This is also one of the features of the, the, the code. So the very important shift is the, the, the present system of creating standard, developing standards on occupation safety and health has been given to your board uh, with the consisting of a tripartite body, consisting of experts, which will transform whole, the whole standard setting process in the country at large. And of course, uh, there will be state government, appropriate governments, for example, factories, appropriate government to the state government, they will make the rule and the inspector is uh, named as a inspector facilitator wherein his work is not only inspector a, a kind of a finding fault it is also a kind of a facilitation of the process facilitation of occupation safety and systems in the factory there has been a reduction in the applicability criteria when it comes to safety of the welfare officer and lot many features. Uh, the idea is, you know, it's a kind of a unified, a comprehensive, uh, a single uh, code, which subsume 13 legislation. And you'll all uh, find it, uh, go through the code, you'll be understanding uh, the various uh, systems that have been introduced in the code by the government. So as a conference, uh, you all know that this is an occasion like today we have Yoshi Kawakami from Ireland. It's a kind of, uh, you know, in this COVID-19 situation, it is necessary for us to uh, interact. The knowledge learning process should not be stopped. And of course, the platforms and the advent in the technology is helping us to take care of these uh, interactions. And we are able to even learn and communicate and to acquire knowledge and improve our information and skills by interacting with the people. And uh, I'm really glad that so many participants are there in the program being a Sunday, Saturday, and being Navaratri uh, first day celebration. That shows uh, the commitment to the conference and commitment to occupation safety individually. I once again like to thank uh, the organizers and of course, I know many of the school speakers are known to me and I've interacted on different occasions and they had uh, having very high knowledge and resource. And I would also be glad to listen to them. And such learning, you know, listening only improves our knowledge and understanding of the subject. I'd like to again congratulate and thank the co speakers also for having taken time out to come to this conference. With this, uh, I thank everyone and particular organizers and the delegates wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so very much for giving us a very long.
my uh, perspective about uh, the current situation and the development and also the new legislation which has been over and uh, 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 has been introduced and also uh, how you wish to proceed towards the future. Uh, and uh, I am sure with a good uh, 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 taking and the uh, consolidation of the uh, legislation and also intent of the government, I think. Uh, the uh, environment will improve in the occupational health and safety. And with your leadership now, the industry will be getting a lot of uh, support and uh, direction uh, to make, make their operations more and more uh, healthier and safe. So thank you so very much uh, for your wonderful keynote address uh, and setting the tone for this conference. Uh, with this, I uh, would uh, uh, request. Uh, uh, now, Kami, uh, I see that he has uh, to say in the beginning uh, that he has been with the Institute of Science of Labor. Uh, we know uh, because the Pukoki is so affected globally. So I am very delighted to see the reference. So good morning, and once a uh, little bit introduction about him. He is a medical doctor and, of course, PhD. Uh, in public health from Tokyo Medical and Dental University of Japan. Uh, he has very wide experience in, uh, in, in, in a very wide center. I will just uh, highlight some of those. Uh, though he is now currently a senior specialist on occupational safety and health and labor institutions in the ILO, uh, different world hospital support team in the New Delhi. Uh, he also provides technical advisory services in the national policy and programs uh, and promote participatory action oriented training for improving all very important as well as informal economy uh, works in seven countries and for the Delhi office of ILO, uh, including Afghanistan, Bangladesh, India, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Before joining, uh, you worked in ILO headquarters in Geneva as senior specialist in occupational safety and health from 2011 to 2017. Uh, promoted ILO OSH standards and assisted member states in developing and implementing strategic national OSH programs. Uh, prior to working in Geneva, Dr. Kawakami worked in ILO w, uh, DWT in Bangkok from 2000 to 2011, working on the strengthening of national OSH systems in East and Southeast Asian and Pacific countries. In particular, he was engaged in promoting occupational safety and health of small enterprises and informal economy workplaces. Develop easy to use OSH training modules for workers and employers and train many local OSH trainers in various workplaces. So he's going to speak to us. Uh, good morning and once again, again, welcome to you, sir. It was great, uh, great to meet you earlier in this city. And I hope once the COVID uh, problem goes off, uh, we will have an, another opportunity, maybe maybe several opportunities to uh, be with you and uh, uh, and uh, welcome you and have your very, very learned experience and sharing of thoughts. So with this, I hand over the floor to you, sir. Please, please follow. Thank you. Okay, good morning, Namaskar. Thank you very much, Dr. Nari Krishna Singh, Dr. Irangobang, or you know, ICC, friends and the colleagues. So thank you very much for inviting Jairo to this very important you know, event on occupational safety and health, in particular for I think COVID-19 pre uh, prevention. So today I'd like to uh, emphasize the focus on you know, ILO experiences, how we have worked together with many employers and workers and the government, you know, institutions for practically promoting the preventive measures for over, uh, COVID-19 at the workplace level. Okay, so may I sh uh, share the screen, share my uh, PowerPoint, you know, the presentation. Uh, I think, okay, uh, which one? Maybe this one it works. Hope uh, everyone can see uh, my PowerPoint. So 
So yes, yes, we can. I understand and now. Yes. Okay. No, I think all you know, ICC members and the members enterprises. I be, I'm sure you have been working very hard for promoting, you know, okay, practical how to got the measures uh, for COVID-19 prevent prevention in your workplaces. So actually, also I have been working together with many enterprises in this regard. And then we have been very much you know, encouraged because many employers and workers in their workplaces, they have already implemented a lot of you know, uh, good you know, uh, efforts for preventing uh, COVID-19. So today I'd like to review all these efforts and we'd like to discuss and then how they have carried out all these improvements and how we can continue to continue this kind of you know improvement measures for you know uh, of course safety and health of workers and also for as I say sustaining your businesses because I, we are very sure without preventing COVID-19 at the workplace you cannot uh, continue your businesses so that's why it is very important we can go together the business sustainability promotion and COVID-19 prevent prevention at the workplace. I think everybody knows, but now the major causes of the new coronavirus infection, COVID-19, there are two major causes. The first one is droplet infection. So sometimes, you know, occasionally, maybe some workers or, I don't know, managers or visitors, they might cough or sneeze, et cetera, at the workplace. Then if infected, they can easily spread the COVID-19 virus to others. So that's why this can be one of the major causes of the COVID-19 infection. So you have to, at the workplace level, we have to be sure how we can stop this kind of droplet, you know, spread or infection. And second, you know, major causes of the work uh, COVID-19 is contact infection. I'm sure you know, you know, if someone coughs or sneezes, then maybe their droplets come to their fingers and the hands and arms then they may contact others through handshakes or maybe by contacting the one offs keyboards, you know, as a hard to call it, uh, rich, rich contact, you know, units and areas. Then the next person like me, like you, that we might contact, attach those door knobs or keyboards, et cetera, without knowing virus is already there. Then we may get infected. So this is very, very second important second point, you know, for preventing the disease in your workplaces. And in addition now, also many scientists have been confirming, you know, uh, so-called air, I can say air infection, airflow infection can be possible. Maybe the COVID virus can float and stay longer in the air. Then maybe workers and then any person who inhale that air can be con contaminated or infected. But I think at, at this moment, uh, practically, at the workplace level, this number one, number two, I mean, droplet infection and the contact infection, are two major causes. At the workplace level, we have to always consider how we can prevent these two uh, infection, you know, uh, causes at the workplace level. So actually, now, COVID started early this year. So since then, I know many enterprises, many business people have been working very, very hard to stop or block the infection. And I know uh, we have conducted many, many webinars like today, and we found already many enterprises carried out a lot of you know, improvements, particularly carried out joint risk assessments and improvements by employers and workers together for preventing COVID. So you can look at uh, the pictures in this slide, you know, actually maybe in your workplace, there are a lot of, you know, potentially how to call it, crowded workplaces or crowded work units or kind of crowded time of work. So these are the most, you know, risky point or you know, risky time or risky area. So it is very important to work as employers you can discuss together, but not face-to-face -face discussion, maybe through internet or through with physical distancing. But they can identify what, kind, what part of your work or your businesses can 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 have, you know, 
that kind of very crowded work area to work time, then how they can work as employers can reduce or mitigate that crowdedness. This is a very, very essential point. Actually, many successful enterprises, they have carried out this type of very practical risk assessment by workers and employers, and they have implemented a lot of prevention measures. So now I'd like to show you the four tips, actually referring to ILO guidelines, WHO guidelines, and I think India also, ESIC, I think we no? They have developed a lot of guidelines or reference materials. So I just picked up uh, some very, very common, common sense areas. So tip one, of course, we should be very careful for practical, physical distancing. I think sometimes we may say social distancing, but the uh, ILO, United Nations, we prefer the word of physical distancing because the social distancing a little bit sounds like of a kind of a connotation of a kind of discrimination. I'd like to avoid him or her socially. So, so we prefer to use physical distance. But anyway, the same meaning practically. So as you know, uh, ILO guidelines, we always recommend on each workstation or each worker should keep around two meters from each other. So, but anyway, this is not a law and regulation. This is a kind of a technical guideline. So in the workplace level, you can try your best, you know, to keep two meter away from each other. However, you know, other guidelines, for example, WHO guidelines, they said maybe at least one meter, because knowing that some workplaces or maybe some, some situations like uh, on the vehicle or on the bus or on the very crowded, you know, workplaces temporarily, maybe two meter, maybe not possible. But in that case, at least one meter, you should keep distance. So anyway, ideally or technically, we should consider always two meter away, but if not possible, absolutely, at least one meter a distance. This, this should be taken always. Perhaps you know the reason why two meter, I think there are several experiment, medical experiment. If you cough or if you sneeze, you should droplets spread almost around two meter. So if you are away further than two meter, maybe you can be safer. I cannot say not 100% safe, but much, much safer. But within two meter, you may be exposed to those droplets easily. So that's why you have to always keep distancing at least two meter. Principle, actually, maybe your workplace have done also, but many workplaces have carried out a lot of your uh, workplace implement. So look at these two pictures. First on the left hand side, this is a kind of textile factory. So they have, you know, carried out the risk assessment and discussed with workers and employers together. So they decided this. They decided to use only uh, workstation, every two workstations, meaning after this workstation working, a gentleman's working, the next one is empty now. The next, next one, gentleman is working. The next, next is also empty. So not like this. By this way, they can keep two physical distance. Then, next, right hand high side, right hand side. This is an office workplace in India. So the same, same, same. Every two workstation are used now. Now one workstation now absent, empty. The next one, this, uh, uh, this lady is working, but after her, nobody allowed to use. And after that, one gentleman is working. I think now many workplaces are applying this kind of physical distancing method. And of course, with this, you, there are many workplaces now applying the kind of flexible working time. So maybe if, in particular, they can divide workers into two groups. Then one worker comes a bit early in the morning, until work and early, then they go home. The next worker group can afternoon, then work until a little bit uh, late evening. Then they can share the office without being crowded. I think that they can, we can consider the you know, flexible working time and the flexible way of using office spaces, workplaces, keeping physical distancing. And that my and the many workplaces said, the successful manager said, by using this 
workers can work you know, pleasantly without fear. So they can work productively, continuously. And they, you know, they can keep uh, productivity well by doing this kind of extra efforts, you know. Move ahead. So now many workplaces, that production workplace, they can, how can I say, the specify workers' positions. So each worker has his own, her own basic position. And they, are, they should not go out. When, you know, only when they are really needed, they can, of course, go out for toilet or for, 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 for the necessity of work, of course. But otherwise, basically, they should stay in their own, okay, working point. So that with distance in two meters. Because before, maybe people tend to uh, work more flexibly, and then people tend to gather together, work together. But now I think workers, managers can need to protect themselves, then they can stay uh, away together, stay away from each other. So we can apply the same idea like this, you know, also these machine workers, they have their own basic, how can I say, work position like this. So of course we can apply the same, you know, to the meeting time, you know, I think only one worker is allowed to take one long table. By this way, they can keep distance. So I, I'm sure you are applying, but uh, we can also apply the same ideas during for the lift and the elevator. So in this company, only four workers allowed to one lift maximum. And also they should not, uh, you know, to speak face to face. I think now many factories are applying this method, you know, kind of physical. I, can, I think they can uh, clearly, they clearly show the standing point of each worker waiting point, keeping at least, as I said, one meter distance from each other. You know, I, I, I don't know the, some of you are working in construction businesses, or yeah, even you are working in the manufacturing or commerce, et cetera, often you have to do kind of construction, you know, work. Ongoing in your within your premises because of renovation, innovation, something like that. So, in physical distancing practice principle in construction sites. So all workers, perhaps in the morning before start working, before starting working, they can keep two meter away. Then at the same point, you know, we can make quite clearly, I can say, indicate each worker he should be here or he should she should be there so that they can keep distance. So we can apply the same, you know, a principle. It's an elevator lift in a construction site. As you see, so the same things, you know, only four workers allowed in one lift in a construction site. So important, only two workers are allowed for interior work in a construction site. So very often, you know, for interior work, like, I don't know, putting colors and painting, et cetera, et cetera. That one, maybe ventilation is not very good. So kind of a risky place, can be very much crowded easily. So that's why I think uh, many businesses, construction businesses limit the number of workers to be allowed during, for staying during that interior work. And I'm sure many companies have been applying, you know, also I learned, you know, some of our previous training participants, they sent us these kind of pictures, you know, this one, you know, as you see, of course, within the company vehicle for commutation, bringing workers to the factory or bringing back them home in the evening. So this kind of company vehicles can be very much crowded. But now I think only one worker is allowed to use. The one worker can occupy two seats so that you know, they can keep at least one meter distance. So I think that the, the right bottom picture, this illustration also, you can see the same. So of course I know some workers or some managers, they might use taxis or private cars. And I think you, you know better, but uh, only one or two workers are allowed on one car, on one taxi. And then no, 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 be crowded. So we can apply as much as possible this principle when you use public, I don't know, the uh, Uber services or uh, Ola or, uh, you know, even auto rickshaw and the rickshaw, you can reduce number as much as possible. So 
So certainly many companies have been applying the same principles in canteens. So I think the very clever way, you know, many companies, they use the, how can I say, canteen tables, uh, allowing only one worker, and then there should be no worker in front of person eating. So the second worker, it's okay, but nobody in front of him. You know, for as I, as I said, the droplet infection is one of the major causes. If you eat, and if you chat, speak, maybe they have higher risks of getting infection. So that's why if nobody in front of him or her, you can reduce, mitigate the risks. So I think uh, after attending our webinar, you know, this Indian company sent us uh, this picture. I'm very pleased. You see, this is very clever. They have used a carton box. It's, it's a, and maybe it's not a kind of waste, you know, no need to stay. So they have used this as a kind of barrier to prevent the infection. So you see now all workers can eat comfortably because they are all isolated from each other. I think this one, we can do it very quickly. So I, I found, you know, many these implement measures can be done at the low cost, you know. No need to spend a lot of money. And we can fight against the COVID-19 infection at the source, you know. I mean, at the source meaning how we can block the droplet infection, how we can drop, uh, block a contact infection. I think the, I, I'm sure we have been doing a lot of measures like this, but as far as we can promote. Yeah, I think there are many, many simple, low-cost way, practical ways to reduce infection risks and then to protect your workers and also protect your businesses. Actually, we can apply the same in the canteen. Also, of course, workers have to wait in the queue and then at least keep one meter away. We can apply the same principle inside the canteen. So all cooks and the chefs, they can also keep distance. So of course we can apply the same in the uh, okay, so listing corner. So you can keep the, all the benches and the chairs, you know, one, one or two meter away from each other. So we can apply the same in construction site. When they are the workers in the construction site, they are taking rest, but also they can apply the same. They try to keep at least two meter away from each other. And also another interesting idea, also we should avoid, you know, how can I say, uh, passing by on the, how can I say, uh, a transport ways in the factory. So we can apply the one way, you know, uh, use of staircases or one way use of passing paths to reduce direct to human contact. Actually, I've shown a uh, picture uh, in my webinar. Then after that, some companies they showed, they sent me the picture like this. Okay, they already assigned workers, you know, okay, this stair is only for up, and that stair is only for down. So by this way, also, you take and reduce the chance of opportunities for passing by each other, and they also can reduce uh, infection risks. And we can apply the same principle in the construction workers again. So when construction workers carrying materials and working inside the half done construction site, you know, they can also keep two meter away by, by, by indicating these lines. You know, another interesting those common ideas, now it's popularized also this kind of use, transparent barriers or screens to avoid direct human to human contact and reduce infection risks can be particularly used in reception or office areas or, how can I say, for the meeting with your business, you know, partners, and both sides can be very comfortable, right? I found, you know, many business people right to the left-hand side, I found that this is a business scene. Um, I can be a uh, business, businessman with her, his customers, they can discuss more safely because of this transparent screen. And also I found on the right-hand side, this is a textile company. Also they put the barrier side by side, you know, so that also workers can work comfortably. So also I found, you know, many companies, they sent us this kind of pictures, you know, they developed a kind of temporary, very kind of handmade, you know, barrier to, how can I say, uh, to block the firm, uh, face to face contact with us. So the light bottom, this is a 
a kind of example from the office. So I think office workers also they very comfortable by use this kind of carbon, okay, carton box, you know, the barrier. And certainly it is very important to promote teleworking. I think you have been doing. If the work can be done at home, organize telephone or internet meeting instead of face-to-face -face meeting. I think you have been doing, but I think now it's a, a very important skill of managers, particularly human resource development department, how you can organize teleworking most effectively, efficiently to protect workers and the pro uh, prevent infections and still access sustaining business. Look at your delivery workers, or I mean truck drivers, transport drivers, because they tend to go out and might meet many customers. So also we have to deliver, we have to uh, train them to keep at least two meters away when they meet uh, their customers. Okay, now I just talked about the physical distancing things. Now also we should look at the, uh, how to help the workers to maintain hygiene. It's very important to establish a company practice that everyone washes their hands carefully. This is very equally important, you know? I mean, uh, not physical distancing, the washing hands, they are the two most important measures. We have to train workers uh, washing hands carefully. So number one, we can, uh, wash their palms, also between fingers, and also thumbs, and then also, you know, the uh, their fingertips, and also uh, also elbow parts of the arms. So this is very, very important. So you have to train your workers carefully all the steps for, you know, correct uh, hand washing. It's very important to provide a sufficient number of, you know, washing stations. And in particular, I found in this company, they have developed, uh, installed the foot petals. So by by this way, you know, workers no need to touch the, you know, a water tap. Because water taps, many people tend to touch and it can be a kind of risky point. So to avoid this, this company has installed foot petals. This is also a very clever way. And of course, you can provide, you know, uh, hand sanitation, alcoholic solution, or sometimes, you know, chlorine, you know, diluted chlorine solution. And then, at least at the entrance of the gate, and then the entrance of the canteen, or entrance of the particular work unit, et cetera, you can provide this kind of, you know, liquid sanitation. And also, look, look at the right picture. Some companies, they even they provide one alcohol sanitation, uh, sanit uh, sanit to every worker. And also you have to train your workers, you know, if there is a no disposable handkerchief, sneeze or cough into your elbow and not your hand. So this is also very important and they're also very simple way. Another important point, of course, use a mask and fit it into to your face. This left the picture after our webinars, you know, now companies provide masks to all workers and the all workers are now understand you know, how to wear a mask and then they keep wearing a mask. So this can really protect, you know, workplaces and the other workers. And the open windows increase ventilation. This is also very simple, but very, very important. I know before, I think uh, big cities like New Delhi, Mumbai, air pollution was a matter. So we tend to close a window. I know air pressure is now coming back, so it's a bit difficult, but you know, still as much as possible, we better open windows. No need to keep windows, you know, 24 hours, but at least before starting work in the morning, maybe five, 10 minutes, or ideally every one hour, if you can keep open windows for at least for five minutes, then, you know, invite uh, natural air that can quickly blow away all contaminated air with virus. So this is also one of the most you know, efficient way and also very simple and low cost way to prevent infection, mitigate infection risks. And of course, we can assign workers to clean so high touch areas. So like water taps, runoffs or control panels. 
because you know many people simultaneously tend to touch those areas. So the risky area, we call it the high touch area. So workers, employers, they can discuss and make a brainstorming what kind of high touch areas you have in your workplace. Then you can ask the cleaner, cleaner workers to clean them regularly. Even in construction site, I know this company has assigned workers to clean the, how to call it, the, the wheels and the control levers and control panels. These are also high touch areas for cleaners. I found this a little bit interesting and innovative, you know, to avoid touching the high touch area. This company developed this kind of, you know, uh, installed this kind of chain so that workers no need to touch the door knobs. So they can open doors without touching. <laughs> Now, I just talked about uh, sanitation, how to clean high touch areas. And now, tip three, promote self health check of workers. I think you know, we've been doing this is also very, very important point. I know many companies now may be measuring the temperature before allowing workers to come inside. But still, even without, without having temperature, maybe some workers might be. In in the case of COVID-19, as you know, maybe they have no problem, particularly for young patients, but they could infect others. So how we can prevent? So I think self-health check is very important. So we can train workers and then discuss with workers. If you have any blue-like symptoms like a headache, or a slight fever, or a dizziness, or dullness, or you know, throat pain, coughing, sneezing, et cetera, you know, Please don't come to work. Then stay home. And then if still fever continues, you can have a, go to the clinic and then have a test. Then isolate yourself. So this, this kind of, you know, I think understanding is very, very important. And for relating to this very important point, we have to be very sure the workers, don't worry, you will not your, lose your jobs if you don't come to your companies. So please don't come to your companies while you have a symptom. Then after recovery, you are welcome to come back to the workplace. We have to be very sure about it because otherwise many workers, they are afraid to lose it. They might, you know, they might pretend they are healthy and they keep coming to the workplace. Then could infect other workers. Then your business will be very much affected. I think this kind of you know, education, trust relationships and the self-health check is very, very important. So company, companies should you know, keep uh, contact with those sick workers or standby workers. So no worries, you can just concentrate on your recovery. Are we waiting for you after your recovery? The test becomes negative. Now you are welcome to come back. And also, as you know, as much as possible, standby workers, sick workers, we can consider they lose all income, they have no, no money, no rice, no, no food. So of course, this is not a company's single responsibility or kind of societal responsibility, but we have to consider you know, how we can help those standby workers who have lost incomes, at least temporarily. Point, tip four, joint risk assessments by employers and workers together. I already mentioned, you know, I found all successful companies, I mean, successfully, how can I say, containing uh, infection risks. They have carried out kind of a joint risk assessment between workers and employers. They have worked together. They have identified risky areas like high touch areas or crowdedness areas. Then they have discussed together how they can reduce this risk, these risks. So, I often say to employers, workers are employers' eyes to identify and mitigate COVID-19 risk. So they know actually what kind of you know, risky places, I mean, crowdedness, high touch areas, et cetera, can happen. So workers are often the first person to notice COVID-19 risks at the workplace. So I know many successful managers, they always invite, encourage workers to speak their ideas. Then managers can you know, discuss and to decide how to make take some measures for prevention. Okay, this is my last slide. So I often say OSH risk is business risk. Or COVID-19 risk is also business risk. And the workers of employers, as I said. 
So important is number one, combat COVID-19 risk at the source, meaning we can identify the risk at the source, meaning crowdedness, high touch areas, or risky behaviors. Then we can you know, improve, take measures at the workplace level. Number two, train and educate workers, including contractors and visitors. We cannot isolate the contractor, are you a contractor? So we, are, so we cannot say like this. We have to include them to protect our businesses and also our workers. Number three, use participatory approaches and encourage workers to speak out there. I think I have mentioned already. Number four, organize functioning safety and committee activities in your company. I think many of your companies have committee, safety committee activities. Certainly you can use that safety committee activities as a vehicle, as a, as a, as a the place to identify uh, risks of COVID-19 infection and then invite workers and employers use and gather them together then identify risk and then uh, take the practical measures for mitigating the risk. Okay, this is my last slide. So I have uh, already quickly mentioned how to protect your workers and businesses from COVID-19. Actually, nowadays, many Indian companies have been successfully carrying out a lot of you know, workplace measures. So very important point, number one, practical physical distancing. Number two, equip workers to maintain hygiene. Number three, promote self-health check of workers and provide necessary support to sick workers. Number four, employers, workers should jointly evaluate the risk of COVID-19 infection in their workplaces. Okay, this is the end of my presentation. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Kawakami, for a very wonderful session on this uh, prevention and the good practices you have shared. Thank you so much for highlighting the very important, easy to use uh, and uh, uh, business friendly uh, uh, solutions. I think uh, the participant uh, uh, conference uh, would be very extremely benefited by the uh, choices because uh, COVID is uh, not gone, it is staying and maybe for a few more months, we are not, the uh, scientific community is not uh, able to predict, but uh, so we have to take care in the industry. And your last line, that the OSH risk is business risk. I like it very much because, uh, you know, the business interruptions which it bring uh, could be very, very uh, high. So uh, COVID as well as the occupational safety and health risks, so, from whatever source, maybe is a very uh, important. Uh, and you have uh, also indicated about the participatory approach, wash in your del uh, in your in your deliberations, and I think that is very very uh, important uh, thing to uh, implement the wash in the industry. I thank you so much, sir, for your very very thoughtful, very wonderful presentations, and uh, it was very nice to hear you again on uh, today. And I am sure we will have. Uh, similar opportunities in future as well. With this, I hand over to ICC team uh, for taking this for Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sen. Uh, I would now request uh, Dr. Rajiv Singh, Director General, uh, Indian Chamber of Commerce, for his uh, vote of thanks. Good morning, all. eminent experts sharing their expertise and knowledge with us. Uh, I think nobody could imagine a few months back that uh, uh, the safety and health will have, will face this kind of challenge and a new dimension in terms of COVID will get added to uh, the health and safety for the workers and for the citizens. But I must say India has uh, responded to it very well. Uh, I think today after uh, so many weeks is probably the first time that the active number of cases in India have uh, dropped below 
800,000, which is a very good sign. And I think it's now almost 20 days, more than 20 days that the cases, active cases have been dropping. So India is coping up and, uh, but initiatives like this definitely highlight the best practices. And uh, we are thankful to our eminent experts, starting with uh, uh, the panel chairman, Dr. Ken Sen. I think he himself has been a champion for uh, safety and health, and he has done tremendous work. Uh, we are extremely uh, thankful to Dr.